Even for a man who based his entire political career on discarding norms and traditions, the collective shock, though, over the president's latest remarks is both extraordinary as it is deep and wide. Americans woke up to these headlines today. The Washington Post's opinion page declaring the nation can only weep. The Chicago Sun-Times editorial calling him America's bigot in chief. Seeing as Jeff Zeleny is outside Trump Tower right now in New York with much more on what's the view from inside the president's circle. So what is the word from inside the president's circle today, Jeff? Well, Kate, we have received a tweet just moments ago from the president who's actually uh, a focus on what is going on there in Charlottesville. Let's take a look at this uh, tweet. I believe we have it here. It says the memorial service of today for the beautiful and incredible Heather Heyer, a truly special young woman. She will be long remembered by all. That is a tweet from the president. But Kate, this is something that the president's advisors were hoping he could have talked about yesterday. They were hoping he could have continued his uh, theme of the speech that he uh, began earlier in the week uh, when he was at the uh, White House, condemning the acts of hate over the weekend. But instead, we all saw that he took a different approach. He decided to uh, show his, uh, his private frustration at the criticism of his initial reaction uh, publicly, as we've all seen now. But let's take a, back, a, a, a quick look at this moment that is still causing so much controversy among Republicans. Like you said, Senator Lindsey Graham, it's because of the president saying both sides. Let's watch. Well, I do think there's blame. Yes, I think there's blame on both sides. You look at, you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. So there we heard the president saying both sides, both sides. But, Kate, that is what has uh, frustrated uh, many presidential advisors. Uh, they're being very silent about it this morning, I have to say. There's uh, been very little public reaction. One administration official I talked to earlier this morning uh, said this, Kate, we have work to do and we're going to do it. Uh, but the reality is this has complicated the president's legislative agenda as well. So many Republicans he needs to work with him, and indeed their supportive of his agenda simply wish that he would talk about that and would have stuck to the script of infrastructure yesterday, was designed to turn the page to do that, but he, of course, did not. But he'll be leaving Trump Tower here um, in a few hours, going back to New Jersey. And, Kate, we are just getting word in that he'll be actually going to Camp David on Friday to discuss with his National Security Council his Southeast Asia strategy, his military strategy in Asia. So this is uh, something, again, the White House trying to get back on track. The president himself often drags them in the other direction. Okay. Uh, off the rails as of yesterday. Jeff, real quick, though, you mentioned that you heard from someone within sure. the White House saying that they've got work to do and they're going to do it. I mean, it does beg the question, what kind of work are they talking about? Are they talking about getting back to the agenda or are they talking about work to do to try to heal the wound that he created with his comments just yesterday. I mean, you have to wonder when you see those photos from when he held that press conference yesterday um, of John Kelly kind of hanging his head, Gary Cohen, Jewish members right. of his inner circle, Jewish members of his cabinet, African, the African-American member of his cabinet. What are they saying? What are they doing today? Well, I would put them in the, the, uh, the category of people who have been utterly silent about this. Uh, um, you saw the looks on their faces. Chief of Staff John Kelly, uh, I mean, the look on his face was very dispirited, uh, disappointed. But as we know, he, is, uh, he has explained his job as trying to bring order to the staff, not the president. He knows that that is, uh, A, impossible to do, and B, something that he cannot do. But there is deep disappointment among some of these staff members. But when they say we have work to do, they're talking about the legislative agenda. They're talking about just trying to uh, focus on, on that. But I think that misses the, uh, the magnitude of this. Okay, we heard the president earlier, earlier this week saying that he has condemned those remarks as it was a one-time event in past tense, then can move on. Of course, that's not the case here. He has opened up uh, many old wounds. He has sided with with uh, supremacists, with members of the Ku Klux Klan. David Duke, as we know, praised this president. So there's no question the White House cannot turn this page. They cannot move forward with their agenda until he addresses this, and he alone will have to do this. He's not scheduled to make any comments today, Kate. We'll let you know if that changes. All right, Jeff, great to see you. Thank you so much. Jeff Stanley's on top of it for us from that angle. This morning, another measure of the president's remarks and how they're being received. Four of the nation's top military leaders, all Joint Chiefs of Staff, have taken to Twitter to condemn racism and bigotry. These men are the president's top advisors on military and national security issues. What are they advising the president today? 
CNN's Barbara Starr is joining me now from the Pentagon on all of this. Barbara, can you give us some perspective on this? This seems pretty extraordinary. It is very rare, Kate. Uh, to be clear, none of them are directly challenging the president or right. criticizing the president. But make no mistake, the Joint Chiefs have now stepped of their own free will into this national conversation. And I think it's very important to see what they are tweeting. Let me start with the head of the U.S. Air Force, General David Goldfein, himself a combat veteran, saying, quote, I stand with my fellow service chiefs in saying we're always stronger together. It's who we are as airmen. The head of the Army, General Milley, the Army doesn't tolerate racism, extremism, or hatred in our ranks. It's against our values and everything we've stood for since 1775. Head of the Marine Corps, no place for racial hatred or extremism in the U.S. Marine Corps. Our core values of honor, courage, and commitment frame the way Marines live and act. And the head of the U.S. Navy, very direct, saying events in Charlottesville, unacceptable and mustn't be tolerated in the U.S. The US Navy forever stands against intolerance and hatred. They are speaking to several audiences here. They are speaking to their troops. We know the man charged in the murder of, of Heather in Charlottesville served in the Army very briefly. We know one of the heads of one of these white supremacist groups served in the Marines. They are speaking to their troops. They are speaking to veterans saying this is intolerable. This will not be tolerated in U.S. military ranks. But they are also very aware, we know, that there is this national conversation. And they know that when people see these pictures in Charlottesville, they see people dressed in fake military gear uh, to a large extent. They see this these images, and now the Joint Chiefs speaking out, and it's so extraordinary, Kate, because really, since the moment Donald Trump started running for president, they had been very determined to stay out of what some might call a domestic political issue. Today, not so much. They are weighing in. Kate? It's really remarkable. Barbara, thank you so much for bringing us that, bringing us that important perspective. We'll be coming back to you. All right, we're also going to be getting back to Charlottesville to that memorial service for Heather Heyer throughout the, for, throughout the hour. We are keeping our eye there in Charlottesville. We will be, be getting back there in just a moment. But joining me to discuss everything that has transpired, former Democratic mayor of Philadelphia, Mayor Michael Nutter is here, and CNN political analyst and USA Today columnist Kirsten Powers is here, David French with the National Review, and also White House reporter for The Washington Post, Abby Phillip. Thank you so much all for being here. Abby, first to you, um, I wanted to get your reaction to the statement that Lindsey Graham put out that I read a little uh, at the top of the hour and where he calls out the pre president pretty directly, where many Republicans have not. What do you take? What's your take on it? Well, it's not entirely surprising because, as you noted, Lindsey Graham is not a, a stranger to criticizing the president. But it's telling because it sounds in some ways like he's signaling to the rest of his party this is the direction that you need to go in, that your statements need to be a little bit more strong. Um, and, and I think, you know, Republicans have to kind of talk to each other here. They have to signal to each other what's okay. I know that sounds kind of uh, cynical, but this is politics. And sometimes people are hesitant to stick their necks out, um, especially criticizing a president in their own party. So I think Lindsey Graham is um, someone who has often been a strong uh, and a vocal uh, person out there uh, pushing back on Trump, but it's not notable also because he is a senator from a southern state. Exactly. It is important for him to say that, uh, to, to actually uh, be on the front lines of an issue like this, because uh, this is a debate that's going on in South Carolina, too. I remember when I, you know, a couple years ago after the Charleston shooting, they had a, a whole debate about whether to take the Confederate flag down. That was a key moment for those lawmakers in that state. Southern Republicans have to lead the way on this um, and unfortunately help their brothers and sisters in, in their own party figure out what to do here. David, I want to get your perspective on this because um, we've seen a, some other Republicans, big name Republicans like John Kasich, John McCain, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, all of them either mavericks or have run against Donald Trump, notably, um, calling the president out by name. But then there was this. Manu Raja reported this this morning. David, is that the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is privately upset with the president's handling of this episode. That's according to a source close to the leader. Is that enough, David? <laughs> it's nowhere near enough. I mean, I, I, at this point, you know, what you have, I think, is you still have a lot of Republicans with their heads in the sand, that they're sitting there thinking, 
let's just get through these bad news cycles and we can still accomplish some good things with the president's agenda. We can lower taxes. We can do some other good things. But they have to, they cannot miss that there is a larger cultural conversation. There's a larger cultural significance to what's happening here. And that larger cultural significance can swamp two to three percent on tax rates and its long-term importance. And, and what you had here was the President of the United States gave a press conference that was the press conference of the alt-right's dreams. And that's a significant moment. The alt-right was celebrating this moment because in many ways they viewed that he mainstreamed them, that he distinguished them David, from Nazis. I'm only going to jump in for one second. I want to take us back to Charlottesville right now.